Thanks for coming to this session uh, on uh, resourcing. I'm here with Martin Klein, who works with me at uh, Los Alamos uh, National Laboratory. So resourcing uh, is a project that ran over the past uh, two years. It's a collaboration between uh, NISO and the Open Archives Initiative. It was funded by the Sloan Foundation and there were contributions from uh, JISC uh, also. And resourcing um, is all about devising a specification for web-based uh, synchronization of resources. And of course, uh, we'll explain to you uh, what that exactly means and what the framework looks like that uh, came out of this effort. <clears throat> so this is an overview of the presentation. I'll start with problem domain, scope, overview of the framework, and then uh, Martin will kick in because this is where the XML will start showing up. And so he will do technology. We actually have a little demonstration uh, prepared for you also about um, a particular capability of resource sync related to sending out change notifications. Uh, so Martin is going to do that. For this audience, it's probably easiest to sketch what resource sync is about by going back to the protocol for metadata harvesting that most of you, I think, uh, are familiar with. Um, PMH was all about recurrent exchange of metadata between what we used to call a data provider and a service provider that would do something you know, meaningful uh, with the metadata exposed by repositories. Important note to make is that those that protocol was devised in the days that a lot of repositories only had metadata and no full content yet. Yeah, there were these days in the past. And so PMH was all about exchange of uh, XML metadata. A repository-centric design uh, in the sense that you know, the architecture of the World Wide Web was not very well known yet in those days. This was before the REST principles had been formulated. And you see all of that uh, throughout the protocol. So it was devised in 99 to 2002 and has been used uh, globally uh, ever since. So contrast that with a resource sync. There's clearly a similarity in the problem domain uh, because it's also about recurrent exchange of information. But here we're talking about synchronization of web resources. So basically anything that has an HTTP URI and has a representation. And you want to synchronize those between what we will call a source and destinations. Okay? And so again, everything here is about web resources, things with HTTP URI. This is entirely resource centric, so it's totally based on web architecture principles, uh, the key ingredients of web interoperability, and then we leverage actually some of the notions, existing notions of search engine uh, optimization, and Martin uh, will talk about that. So here's the abstract uh, problem statement. <coughs> There's a source, okay, it's a server, and the source has resources, so things with HTTP URIs, that change uh, over time. They get created, modified, deleted, and then there's destination servers that want to do something with the sources' resources. You know, want to build a search engine maybe, want to preserve the material uh, that is available at the source, uh, and so on. And so as the resources change at the end of the source, the destination wants to keep track of the ongoing changes. So it wants to remain uh, synchronized, basically. We have this kind of depiction that will come you know, back throughout uh, the presentation. So let's presume this is a source, and it has, at a certain moment in time, these three resources. So A, B, and C are HTTP URIs. And so these resources start to evolve. So resource A gets updated, then D gets updated. Uh, now, at the same time, A and B get updated. Oh, a new resource is created. And then there's one deleted, and there you go, yet another one uh, is being updated. And so the whole notion is when we are a destination that is interested in you know, these resources of the source, how do we keep track of uh, what is going on there? And how do we do that in a way that is better than recurrently pulling 
all these resources to see whether they have changed. You know, as soon as you have a sizable collection of resources that just not a scalable proposition anymore, you cannot continuously do uh, HTTP heads to see whether these resources have changed. And then a newly created one, you would not even be able to detect, right? Because you don't know where to go uh, and actually pull. So that's the, the problem domain, really. And so the goal of the effort was to design an approach for resource synchronization that is fully aligned with the web architecture and that you know, stands a chance of being developed and implemented in this kind of community. But also, we were hoping that we could devise a solution that had a broader uh, impact. <coughs> what I just said relates actually to some of the choices of technologies we made, as uh, Mark will describe. Scoping-wise, we were actually rather ambitious in the kind of cases we wanted to be able to cover. And that goes actually in several uh, dimensions. So there's a few parameters at the side of the source and the destination. And then there's also classes of use cases uh, that I will cover. So first of all, the size of a sources collection. We wanted a solution that works for really small resource collections, you know, little museum site maybe with a couple of objects, you know, up to really large repositories of publishers you know, like Elsevier's millions and millions uh, of resources. Change frequency. You know, again, we have a range there of very slowly changing resources, maybe on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis. And on the other end of the spectrum, extremely rapidly changing things like Wikipedia or DBpedia, where we measured basically changes of about two per second. Okay, so we want to be able to cover that also. At the end of the destination, does the destination care about latency? Does it want to be in the second aligned with what goes on at the source? You know, maybe because it wants to do real-time visualization of changing data sets out there? Or is it OK to be a bit behind the curve? You know, for example, if you are going to implement discovery services, it's not necessary that you're really in the second aligned with a collection out there, right? So again, we wanted to be able to cover both. And then coverage of the resources. Does the destination need to cover all of a source's resources? Or is it acceptable to only have a few, you know, miss a few and just, you know, be more or less synchronized? But, you know, you know so how, how correct as the coverage uh, to be. Let me give an example. If we talk about the digital preservation scenario, then most likely you really want everything. But again, in the discovery scenario, maybe it doesn't matter all that much that you miss out of three or four PDFs out of a couple thousand, right? <clears throat> Bitstream accuracy, again, the dis digital preservation use case is an, an interesting one. Let's say a destination is in charge of preserving someone's PDF collection. Now, when it's a preservation case, the destination really wants to know that it indeed collected the accurate bit stream. So we're talking about content-based hashes and stuff like that, right? Where, again, in the discovery scenario, it doesn't matter. I brought the file across, can't index it, well, so what? You know? So again, those are different types of uh, requirements down to the classes of use cases now that we wanted to cover. Here is a source with its resources. And this is the notion of one-to-one -one synchronization. This is something that exists in almost all institutions, you know, where you need to move content from one location to another you know, to do added value services, maybe. So this is a classic uh, basic use case. One to many. So there's a master copy. This is like the physics archive and its mirrors around the world. So this is a use case that we wanted to be able to cover. And actually, Simeon Warner is now implementing Resource Sync uh, for the archive uh, at Cornell. All the way around, very common use case is the aggregator one. So let's take uh, Digital Public Library of America, Europeana, Core, where there's multiple repositories, and their content needs to be brought to a central location. Okay. So that's a use case that we want to cover. Selective synchronization, different types of resources at the source, videos, text, images, who knows. And 
the destination is only interested in videos. Okay, that's another case. And then, of course, XML metadata harvesting, as specified by the protocol for metadata harvesting, is just a special case. Because in this worldview, XML is just resources with URIs. You can be referenced the URI and you get the XML metadata back. So it fits in the picture of resource sync also. Overview of the framework. So we've seen this before. This is the source and the sources, uh, resources are evolving over time. So what resource sync is about is the question really, what can the source do to make it easy for destinations to remain in sync with the evolution of its resources. And in order to answer that question, it's good to think about, you know, think from the perspective of the destination. So the destination is going to look at the source out there and say, okay, I wanna, I wanna keep in touch, I wanna remain synchronized. There's really three basic requirements that need to be covered. First one, baseline synchronization. This means the destination is not at all in sync, has none of the source's resources, and says, I want to do catch-up operation, you know, an initial throughput of information so that I'm in sync for the first time with the source. Once that is done, we now want incremental synchronization. This means as time goes by and as the source's resources evolve, the destination wants to co-evolve. Okay, it wants to remain in sync. Third one, audit. Basically, the question, well, I think I am in sync as a destination with the source, but am I? And there's really two dimensions in that. One is the coverage notion that we talked about. Do I have all of the source's resources? And the other is accuracy. Do I actually have the right bit streams, or did something go wrong in the transportation uh, of the bit streams? These are the requirements that are being met by the capabilities that are being introduced in resourcing. So they all talk to these requirements of a destination. So here we go. In this slide, you basically have the essence of the entire solution of resourcing. It's very simple. There's the notion of a source publishing an inventory. This is what I have. These are my resources. No rocket science here, and obviously an inventory will be a list of your eyes, you know, and then some, okay? Publish changes. I'm now going to put out as a source a document that is going to talk about all the changes that happened in a certain temporal interval between time zero and time one, these are the changes that occurred to my resources. Third one, notifications about changes. Not wait an interval and then say what changed. As the change occurs, I'm going to let you know. Okay. And then for all of these cases, there's a notion of the communication payload. What is it that the source is going to communicate? Well, again, minimally the URI but maybe for certain use cases more, for example, content-based hash, right? Because you want the destination to be able to verify bitstream accuracy, okay? And I'll come uh, to all of that. So first component, and we call that the capability in resource sync, uh, for a source to implement is this thing that we call a resource list. And a resource list is really the inventory of the source. Okay. And it is a snapshot view at a certain moment in time. This is what I have. Here are my URIs. Okay. And so the process that happens here, somehow the destination discovers where that resource list is, pulls the resource list in, now looks at all the URIs and one by one goes and collects the resources with those URIs. Okay. It's very simple. Source publishes a document that we call a resource list. Document is a list of URIs. And then the, the destination just goes and collects uh, all these uh, URIs. There's an optimization to that that I will not discuss in any detail. But basically, it consists of the source wrapping up 
bit streams of its representations in a zip file and making it available and publishing a document where those zip files are available. Okay, that's just an optimization. It means that the destination now does not have to go one by one and dereference all these HTTP URIs. Again, I'm not going to talk any further about that. So here we are. Remember, this was our little scenario of how things change at the source. So basically, here we are. This, the source says at TX, I'm going to publish a resource list. And so what is going to be in that resource list? Well, it is the state of its resources at time x. That means it's this one, it's this one, it's this one, and not this one because this one was deleted. So I'm not going to talk about the deleted one in an inventory. All right. So that's basically the resource list of this source is these three URIs. <clears throat> Next up is the change list. So again, the change list now talks about change events that occurred in a temporal interval decided by the source. Okay, how long that interval is, how short that interval is. <coughs> this fits in to the notion of incremental synchronization now. Okay. In a change list, you always, of course, have the URI of the change resource, but you also have the daytime of the change. And you then also have the notion of what happened to that resource. Was it created, updated, or deleted? Okay. And so in the same kind of way, this is just a document that the source publishes it there. The destination finds that document, dereferences it, sees all the URIs listed in it, and you know, goes after the representations. And then for the created and updated one, yeah, it gets those representations for the deleted ones. If it has a copy of the deleted ones, it removes it uh, from its collection. Again, there's an optimization here, like the zip uh, thing that I talked about, uh, but no details. It's all in the spec. So let's look at this now. Again, we have the evolution of the source's resources here. And now we say, oh, I'm, the source is going to publish a change list with all the changes that occurred between TY and TZ here. Well, so what is it going to contain? Well, A and B, they were updated at time C. This was created at time D. This one was deleted. Okay? And this one was updated. So pay close attention here. The same resource will occur twice in the change list because in the interval, it changed twice. And the change list notifies about every single change to a resource. It is actually quite important in a certain uh, use case. Okay, so down here, you see what the change list is between TY and TZ. You still with me? That's simple, right? Now change notification. So resource list and change list are all about publishing a document. And then the destination finding that document and acting, acting upon the information in that published document. Now, if we have a use case where the destination requires really low latency, then we're not going to do that published document thing because the destination doesn't know how frequently to poll, how frequently changes are going to happen. This is where we can send notifications out. So this is where a destination will subscribe to a published subscribe mechanism. And the source is actually, as things change, going to push information about that change out. Okay. So the information in there is the same kind of information as in the change list, URI, daytime, and nature of the change. And in this case, the destination doesn't have to go collect the document at all. It just receives the push notification, OK? So here's the uh, example again. As a changes, we're sending out a change notification, a little blob of information that says, this resource changed at this moment. Time goes by. I'm sending another notification out that talks about this updated resource. Here I'm sending a notification out about two resources that changed, right, at the same moment in time. Created, deleted, updated, you catch my drift, right? 
So again, this is push technology, this is not a pull. I'll give you an overview of the three kind of communications that we can have. Resource list, inventory, change list, changes that occurred over a period of time, change notifications, as things change, I'm letting you know, okay? Now we come to the payload. I already mentioned minimally there's going to be a URI in there, otherwise we're talking about nothing, right? Uh, in addition, when it's about changes, we also have the daytime of the change, and we also have the nature of the change, created, updated, deleted. But more information can be added to the payload in order to cover certain requirements of the destination. For example, remember the content-based hash, the audit capability? Well, the source can provide metadata about the resource. For example, the content encoding, content length, mime type, content-based hash. In addition, and it's very webby, we can also provide links that pertain to the resource. And I'll give you a couple of examples later, but for example, linking to mirror copies, alternate representations, versions of the resource, interconnecting metadata and content. I'll talk about that in detail. So the specification gives a couple of examples of how you would like to use uh, links. But basically, every registered link type that is in the IANA link registry, you could use you know, for your own use case. I see that Tim is there. So collection membership is one, for example, if a resource is part of an ORE aggregation, that's what you would use. You would say, well, this resource with this URI link to the aggregation with the appropriate relation type. So first example is about metadata, and I touched up on uh, it already. This is about the content-based hash. So in order to meet a destination's need for audit, the source can provide the content-based hash as metadata. Okay? So source computes the content-based hash, puts it in the payload, you know. Uh, the destination obtains the payload, gets the resource, computes the hash, and compares. Okay. It's as simple as that, but now we are able to audit what we brought back from uh, the source. Two examples of link. First of all, there's this notion of metadata and content that the metadata is about. In the protocol for metadata harvesting, it was always only about the XML, right? Here we basically say, well, an XML metadata record, or whatever type of metadata record, and content, they're just things that reside at the URI, and they can evolve at their own pace. You know. But it would be interesting to know that this metadata is about that content, you know, and that content relates to that metadata. And this is something we would do, again, <coughs> with links. So for example, if we have a metadata record at a certain URI, and it evolves over time. In the payload, when you talk about that resource, you would point to the PDF file, let's say, that the metadata describes. And it would be metadata <coughs> describes, and then the URI of the PDF file, for example. And the other way around, you could also point from the PDF file to the metadata that describes the PDF file. But again, in this world view, these are just resources that live their own life on the web, but they can interlink with an appropriate uh, link relation type. Here's a very interesting one um, that we actually put in on demand by communities that deal with big data sets, huge images, and so on, where whenever the resource changes and the resource now is a couple of gigabytes big, you don't want to send the entire file across the wire time and again. So there's this notion, this hook that we built into the protocol, where you can basically link to a diff between the new version and the prior version. And in this case, the destination can only bring across the diff and apply the patch okay, to the version that it already holds. Now, there's a caveat here. These kind of, so this is expressed by means of MIME types, you know, so the, the type of the diff that goes with the MIME type there's not too many MIME types defined 
so far. There's something for XML, for JSON, but you can define your own. I mean, there's always the X vendor space and you know, in which you could define your own diff kind of formats. Okay. To wrap this up, a few additional characteristics of the framework that we devised. First of all, it's modular. So I talked about these several kind of capabilities like resource list and change list and the, the dumps and all these kind of things. The source doesn't have to implement all of that. It's really modular. It's like Lego bricks. It's going to say, well, because I want to support this kind of use case, I'm going to, for example, implement resource list and change notifications. That's going to be it. That's my resource sync implementation. Okay? So this is not like a standard where you say, I have to implement all of this. No. You're going to select which models are important for your community you know, and that cater to the requirements that you have regarding latency, for example, coverage, you know, audit, and, and so on. Just like we had sets in the protocol for metadata harvesting, there's the notion of sets of resources here also. This caters to the notion of selective uh, synchronization. I only want your videos. Okay, so basically, a server can implement different resource sync implementations for different sets of resources. It's all uh, in the specs. And then there's, of course, the notion of discovery. How does a destination find out whether and how a source supports resource sync? And again, we use webby kind of mechanisms for discovery like robots.txt, well-known URI, and links, okay? To basically lead the destination to a description of a source's implementation of uh, resource sync. And with that, I think we've come to the XML, right, Martin? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the fun part starts. Yeah, exactly. All right, thanks, Robert. So I would like to briefly, in the next 10-15 um, uh, minutes or so, give you a um, little bit more insight into the technology behind uh, resourcing. <laughs> and uh, for one, we'll talk about the technology part of the framework. Uh, as Herbert mentioned, we've prepared a little demo in terms of uh, a video that I'd like to show you as well afterwards. Uh, and then some um, um, concluding remarks in terms of where we're at with the uh, specification and so on and so forth. So for the technology, there's um, two points that I'd like to stress. The first one is the in terms of serialization that resource sync builds on sitemaps. Uh, and sitemaps, as you, I'm sure, know, <laughs> is, is supported and was introduced by you know, all major uh, search engines, certainly the big three. So that's a technology that's widely adopted. Uh, and that plays into our, uh, one of our objectives, obje objectives, that we try to come up with a framework that, is, uh, that has a rather low level of uh, um, uh, adoption, right? So if an institution has a framework in place uh, that already generates sitemaps, the step on top of that to be resource and compliant is fairly small. And that was the goal there. Uh, one strong argument in favor of sitemaps. And uh, another strong argument in favor of sitemaps is the similarity between purposes. Right? What is a sitemap used for? Well, sources, servers use sitemaps to advertise their resources. Uh, towards search engines, granted, but still to advertise their resources. And if you compare that with the purpose of a resource list, it's an inventory, right? I advertise my resources. So there's a uh, strong level of similarity there. And it, uh, logically, from our perspective, makes uh, perfect sense to, to build on top of sitemaps. Of course, the protocol was not uh, made for us, so we had to uh, come up with some enhancements, which, by the way, are all uh, fine with Google and the like, we checked. Uh, so we're, it's not that if you implement resource sync, you violate Google policy or something. It's not, that's not the case. Um, and another beautiful, from my point of view, a aspect of resource sync is that we're using and reusing the sitemap uh, um, um, uh, protocol format throughout the entire framework. So whether it's a resource list or a change list or a change mm -hmm. notification, it's all based on the same format, uh, which makes perfect sense in terms of it's fairly easy to comprehend. Uh, for one, and for two, uh, it's very friendly for developers, right? Because the level of reusability of your code is fairly high. So uh, you'll get plenty of thanks from your developers in this case. All right. So in case you don't know exactly what a, a sitemap looks like or uh, haven't seen it in a while, let me remind you this is the um, very raw structure of a sitemap. Uh, it's usually an XML document, 
It uh, starts with the root element URL set. Okay. Any closing? And for each resource described in a sitemap, you have a URL block. <coughs> Opening URL, closing URL. Within that URL block, you have a lock uh, element, which is also mandatory. Uh, and that lock element holds the actual URI of the resource. Right? So these three elements are mandatory. URL set, URL, and lock. And then often it has last mod to indicate, oh, this is the time uh, the resource has last changed. Um, but that's not mandatory. It's optional, uh, nevertheless, uh, very frequently used. So then the URL, the URL block is, uh, um, is to be repeated for uh, different resources in one sitemap. Okay? So you have multiple URL blocks in the same sitemap, one for each resource. So what we're doing with um, this very simple URL structure is we're putting some enhancements in four resource sync. The first one is um, an, uh, an element that we call MD, stands for metadata. And that has uh, a very important attribute, which means capability. And with that attribute, with the value of that attribute, uh, a destination is able to distinguish how, what am I dealing with? Am I dealing with a resource list, like in this case? Or maybe am I dealing with a change list? What kind of document is that that I just discovered? In this case, again, it's a resource list, and it has another attribute, at, with a date time, which indicates the time at which this resource list has been created. It's the snapshot idea, right? At time x, these are my resources that are subject to synchronization via the resource and framework. And then we are, of course, <coughs> using the URL uh, block structure as well to describe the resources that are subject to synchronization. We have our mandatory lock element, of course, because we need to communicate URIs. We have a last mod. And we have our metadata element, our MD element, in our own namespace, by the way, again, which holds what Herbert mentioned before, the optional um, metadata attributes of that resource that is subject to synchronization. Right. So the resource described for that URI has an uh, MD5 in this case, a content-based hash of this. It has a content length of that. And, oh, by the way, it's of, uh, 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 it has a MIME type application PDF. So that's the, uh, one of the two additional elements that we introduced for the sitemap format to convey additional information. So that's the resource list part. And you will recognize um, another attribute, change, from what Herbert mentioned earlier. For a change list, we not only need to convey the URI of the resource that has changed, but also what type of change has it undergone. In this case, this URI has been updated at this time. And again, uh, to roll back a little bit, we have our metadata um, element up here as well with the attribute capability that uh, um, lets us know that this document is in fact a change list. And you'll also see another difference. It does not have the at attribute anymore. It has the from and until attribute. And you'll recognize this is the temporal boundary. These are the temporal boundaries of the interval that the change list covers in terms of changes to resources. So between time <laughs> Uh, zero and time one, those are the resources that have changed, covered in this change list. Okay. <clears throat> I mentioned we introduced two new elements. The first is MD metadata. The second one is LN, since for link, if you're familiar with the Unix environment, you'll appreciate <coughs> that. Um, so our link element, um, and Herbert mentioned it, allows us to uh, reference to related um, resources. Let's say. So in this case. We give the notion that the resource described with the URI in the lock is described by this other resource, which happens to be metadata about the resource. So with the, uh, with the type, with the uh, relation type, linked relation type described by, we can um, um, connect the, 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 the two elements, the resource itself, the content resource, and the metadata resource, in this case, described by. And uh, if you're familiar with those link types, you have describes, which would uh, uh, describe the, the inverse case. If your lock would describe the metadata element and your link would uh, point to the actual content resource. Okay. All right, so we covered resource list, we covered change list, and of course, uh, the third um, um, capability that we're uh, covering here is the change notification. 
And uh, as promised, it looks very, very similar to what I just showed you. Um, and um, with, um, with one special feature that I'd like to point out here. It is yet another link. And it's one of the few cases where we actually have a diff um, uh, more or less official. So in this case, we, uh, we see that our described resource is of type application JSON. And we link to a diff. So in case the destination now knows A, what uh, a JSON is, B, what a JSON patch MIME type is, it could just take uh, or uh, um, uh, obtain the patch and apply it to its copy of that resource. Right. But uh, that, of course, uh, requires a certain uh, tighter coupling between destination and resource in terms of uh, the, the uh, destination source, I'm sorry, in terms of the source need to be able to support this diff, this patching mechanism, and the destination needs to know what that is, how to interpret this diff, and how to apply it to the original resource. Okay. All right. So that was the first part of the uh, technology uh, section in, in resource sync. And the second is the, um, the, the, the protocol, the push protocol that we are using. Uh, pops up, pop up. Uh, has anyone here in the room used, heard of, read about Pubsa Pubba before? Yeah, a couple. All right, so it has its root in, um, in syndicating Atom and RSS feeds. Uh, however, it, um, it forked off from there a little bit, and now it's more uh, open to non-Atom and non-RSS feeds also. So we're, with this uh, push approach, with this push technology, um, applying a novel level to it in terms of, uh, as Herbert mentioned already, we're enabling a source to push change notifications to destinations, to registered destinations, registered in terms of uh, a destination dis uh, subscribes to a certain um, uh, um, uh, source and it's, it's uh, changing resources. And uh, so that was said before. Um, I think it's, it's um, most intuitive to describe this, um, uh, the overall architecture of uh, push of pops up, pop up uh, in terms of this um, uh, infrastructure Picture. So we have our three components. We have our source, we have our destination. We've talked about those two um, <coughs> components all, uh, all afternoon. And now we, um, we need to introduce a new component in the middle, so to speak, the hub. Right. So the process is as follows. The destination subscribes to the source and it's uh, changing resources through the hub, via the hub. The hub is the middleman. The hub is the one that uh, uh, maintains all subscriptions. The hub knows its source and it knows its destinations. Upon a change of a resource and upon the generation of a change notification at the source, the source sends out that change notification to the hub. That's all the source does, just sending out the change notification. The source does not care who who's listening, who the destinations are. Does not need to care because the hub cares. So it pushes the change notification to the hub, and then the hub basically fans out. The hub knows about all its subscriptions and fans out to the destinations that are interested in uh, those change notifications. Okay, so we have the little middleman uh, in, in between. Okay. Does it make sense so far? All right. Because uh, we have a little demonstration for you, and uh, to, um, to, to visualize or to uh, give you a little sneak preview of what's going to happen in the demonstration, let me show you this. So we have our uh, overview of our source with a few resources. And um, I will show you three things. I will show you the source and its state in terms of a directory listing. Uh, I will show you the destination and its state in terms of a directory listing. And I will show you uh, a, what I call a listener. So a uh, middleman that listens to the traffic that's going on at the source, at the hub, and at the destination. Right? So we'll know exactly where the information comes from, where it goes through, and where it ends up, and what the information actually is. <coughs> so there's um, um, three things. After showing you the state of the source and the destination, I will trigger a process that creates new resources at the source. So the source starts off with the resource A. Then I hit a button, and then the source uh, 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 at the source will create three, four, five, six more resources. <coughs> Those trigger change notifications from the source to the hub. The hub 
uh, fans out those change notifications to the uh, subscribers, to the destinations. In the demo, it's only one. Um, and upon receipt of those change notifications, the destination will obtain those resources from the source with HTTP get. Right. And at some point, the destination and the source will be in sync. I will show you that. Then I have another magic button that triggers another process that deletes those newly created resources on the source. Again. Then again, I will show you the traffic that is flowing from source through hub to destination. And uh, after deletion and the uh, corresponding change notifications, the destination will be left with only one resource, the initial resource A that has not been deleted. Okay? So we, we spin in a circle a little bit. Right, here we go. So you have three points of observations, as I mentioned. I will show you the initial state. Both source and destination have one resource, resource A. We do some magic with creating of uh, resources, and the synchronization process <coughs> is ongoing. After which, I will show you the state of the source and the destination with all resources uh, synchronized. I will delete those resources, and I will show you the final state where, again, source and destination are synchronized, uh, but the resources have been deleted. Okay. See if that works. Okay. I, I realize I tried very hard to increase the font as much as I could. It's a uh, um, fine line between readability and uh, uh, line breaks and things like that. So um, <laughs> for you guys in the back, I apologize. It might be too too small in terms of font size, but uh, I'm happy to um, replay the demo uh, later on in the break and uh, we can even, uh, show this, you know, on the screen here if you can't read. However, so. <clears throat> Um, this demo has been created in the, in the course of the last uh, couple of weeks in the uh, prototyping team at, uh, at LANL. As mentioned, uh, um, Hari Arshankar is the main developer of this, so he deserves credit. Um, and uh, as you'll see, in the, in the top here I have basically uh, four tabs, where the first one is just this one, the little introductory screen, and then I have three tabs which I'll jump uh, back and forth on. The first one you will see is the uh, source our publisher. The second one is the listener that I mentioned that displays the messages that go through the entire framework uh, in our demo. And the last one over here is our uh, um, subscriber in push terms and uh, um, the, the destination in uh, resource terms. Okay. <coughs> it's where I will show you the uh, states. All right, let's start this. There's no audio on the video, so I'll voice over. So this is our publisher, our source, hosted by, on, on a server that we have control over. It has one resource, about dash en.html. And it's an example of our, one of our publications about resource sync, and it tells you that the web is highly dynamic. Some text, OK? It's a regular uh, directory of things. You know, we have these two magic buttons that I will use in a second. And that is our listener. So on the left-hand column, you'll see all messages that come from the source. In the center, you'll see all messages that go through the hub. And on the right, all messages that arrive at the destination. The last tab on the right is our destination. It is in sync right now. It has one resource about dash en.html, with a very similar directory listing structure. <coughs> it's about resource sync. And the web is still highly dynamic. All right, I go back to the source, and I'll trigger the process of creating resources. After clicking the button, I will immediately go to the listener in order to show you the messages that go through the, uh, through the system. I click the button, and I'll see a couple of messages coming in already. The first line in bold is the URI of the newly created resource. And in case you can't read it, this, for example, it's uh, about dash fr about dash de so uh, the different resources we see messages going through the hub and messages at the destination okay so look, let's look at the source about dash de dot html the source tells me that this resource was created it has a certain length and it has a certain content based hash nice we also have about dash fr which is a resource also created different length different hash at the hub we'll recognize our about 
dash de uh, at any bugger or URI, we see that this uh, change notification has been posted to one subscriber. And if you look at the payload, you recognize the change notification. It's a URL set. It has a URL element. It has a lock with the URI about dash de dot HTML. It has a last mod, the time it was created, as it turns out. Change equals created, our attribute. And our content-based hash is included, just like the length and the MIME type. So that's the payload that's been sent. Uh, it's been created at the source, sent to the, uh, to the hub, and uh, further on to the destination. If you look at the payload for the French, or the, for the dash fr document, uh, it's also been created, surprise, surprise, in different hash. So on the destination side, we identify the resource of interest, just for, uh, as an example. The destination tells us, tells us that this resource was created by interpreting the payload, right? Uh, what it does is it goes, fetches the resource from the source, it computes its own uh, content-based hash, and compares it to the content-based hash that the source has computed, and sees, okay, this is a match, trustworthy, for now, maybe. File size is the same, good. <coughs> And looking at the payload there, we recognize the change notification that is received at the destination's end. Okay. So let's look at the source, whether those resources were in fact created. And indeed, they are. We look at uh, the German version of that. Now we're talking über resource sync. And the web is still highly dynamic. And let's look at the French one as well, and even in French. The web is highly dynamic. Okay. So it's a little translation service that we have running just for the sake of demonstrating uh, what can be done. OK, let's look at the destination, whether those resources have indeed been uh, transferred. We do a reload on this directory listing, and voila, uh, the resources are there. So at this stage right now, source and destination are in sync. OK. And we see our German version of the document again. All right, nice. Let's reverse this, and let's start the process of deleting those newly created resources. So ideally, as I mentioned, after this process, only the English version would be left over because it's our static document. So we hit the button, delete resources, and again, look at the listener here to see what messages flow through the system from source through hub to destination. That takes a little bit. This listener, by the way, runs locally, ran locally on my machine. <laughs> All right, so let's look at the source. We see the Russian version of the document, and the source tells us that this resource was deleted. And even the French one was deleted, and sadly enough, the German one was deleted also. <laughs> but the web is still dynamic. <laughs> in English. It's not impossible. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so looking at the hub, uh, we, we identify our German document, yeah, our German URI, uh, um, rather. And looking at the payload now, this is a different change notification simply because the change type has changed, right? It's change deleted, uh, triggered by pressing the button there. And hence, it doesn't make any sense to include an MD5 hash there, for example, because it's a deleted resource. Um, looking at the destination's end, the destination interprets the payload. So, OK, the resource was deleted. I will do the same on my end in order to be synchronized. And looking at the source, indeed, we've seen this before. The um, resources have all been deleted. I do a reload on the destination's end, and uh, we'll see there also the resources have been deleted. So now again, the source and destination are in sync. <coughs> and so what the, the point, the main point, I think, of this demo is that uh, it, it nicely shows the difference between push and pull. Right? So this is a notification service. This is uh, 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 upon change on the source's end, the source generates the change notification and pushes it out in more or less real time. The destination is able to react to that change notification and uh, do the uh, appropriate uh, um, operations in its file system, for example, in order to be and to remain in sync. So this really aims at low latency and um, uh, a bit between uh, source and hub and uh, source and destination. I'm sorry. Uh, unlike for the uh, uh, for a uh, pull-based system where the destination would basically do a guessing game of when to ask for a change list, when to ask for a resource list in order to learn about changes that have occurred uh, in a certain interval. Okay. All right, so that concludes our little demo. And let me just 
just um, uh, conclude real quick with uh, some, some remarks in terms of where we are at with our uh, specification and with the resourcing framework. So uh, uh, fairly far is the short answer. Right? So um, the, the resourcing core specification is right now undergoing the NICE voting poll. Uh, and assuming that this is successful, we're looking at a, a, a NICE specification uh, um, maybe in July of this year. So this, the spec is likely not to change dramatically anymore. So it's fairly solid. Right? Uh, however, we're also maintaining um, a copy the, of, of the specification at the OEI uh, website. I'll show you a pointer later on. So you can always you know, take, a, take a look there as well and see uh, what's, what's going on. Besides the, the core specification, we have uh, two other specifications, one of which uh, describes what I just showed you in the demo, the notification part. Uh, which we isolate a little bit from the core specification. Uh, that's in beta right now, uh, simply because we feel like uh, there's more tests going on with the uh, pops up pop up as a protocol. Um, we uh, will, however, um, release very soon the software, Python based software for all three components the source, the hub, and the destination. So that again, a, or goes in the same direction that we're aiming at a low barrier of adoption. If you feel like this is something that you could use, uh, feel free to, to use our, uh, uh, our first step there, basically, in terms of source code, right? Um, and on top of that, if you feel like, oh, this is nice, but I really don't want to uh, be burdened with implementing entire hub, we're uh, helping you out there as well in terms of we're, we're um, about to provide uh, a hub as a service that you could use to you know, play with, to test uh, um, the the framework to test it in your environment with our hub, basically. Right? That's clearly not a long-term solution, but maybe it helps you take the first step. The second spec that we isolated from the core spec is, the, uh, is an archive spec that also is in beta, um, without going into detail there. But if you, as a source, feel like you need to uh, keep a record of all your resource lists and all your change lists, then uh, the archive spec is for you. If you are going, what, what is he talking about? Never mind. <laughs> a couple of pointers. Uh, I mentioned that on our Open Archives um, uh, website, we do keep a copy of the specification. So feel free to go there, openarchives.org slash rs for resourcing. There you'll find a table of content pointing to the core specification, to the notification specification, and to the archives specification. We have a Google Groups where we invite everyone to provide feedback, uh, leave comments, uh, um, tell us how we're doing. Uh, please let us know if you are interested in, in, in adopting and playing with it and uh, trying. Uh, we're more than, uh, than happy to help and, and give further pointers. And of course, um, some um, references we did build on SiteMap to mention that, and uh, pops up, pop up in its early stages uh, hosted there. All right. Um, so we're a little bit in academia, right? So we did some uh, publishing on this, uh, based on this. Uh, the first one in particular, uh, at last year's JCDL, a short paper that described the fun we had with exploring sitemaps and uh, how uh, search engines use sitemaps and how they would respond to our enhancements of those sitemaps. Um, <laughs> and uh, we get um, um, a couple of dealer papers mm -hmm. as well to describe our philosophy of resource sync and the technical uh, background there as well. I invite you to go check those out. Uh, this, of course, is not uh, you know, just Herbert and me uh, doing this. This is a team effort. Herbert mentioned it. Uh, um, uh, plenty of contributors um, from, from NISO. I just saw Nettie walking in uh, um, without um, you know, this kind of support. This kind of effort is never possible. Uh, I mentioned Harish as the main developer for the, um, for the demonstration. So uh, thanks to those and um, other contributors. Simeon was mentioned. Um, Bernard by now in, back in Vienna, uh, Michael Nelson from Old Dominion, and Carl Legosi by now in Michigan, uh, all um, are key contributors to this effort. I, so this um, concludes our uh, presentation for today. Uh, thanks a lot for your attention. Um, Herbert and I would be happy to answer your questions, and we'll be here today and tomorrow for sure. So if, you, uh, if there's another question that does not uh, come to your mind right now, but maybe tomorrow, uh, just approach us. We're happy to talk to you and answer your questions. Thank you.